gentlemen, Famke Jansen. How are you? Thank you for coming. Welcome. Thanks for spending some time on a Saturday with us. Oh, yes. Man. I love Vancouver. Yeah, I mean, you spend a lot of time here, obviously, in the X-Men movies. What do you remember about uh, those productions being Well, not town? just uh, the X-Men movies. The last couple of years have been uh, filming a bunch here, too. So of course, it's yeah. Just, yeah, it's been an amazing time. So much going on in the city with uh, TV that, and well, film. Well, yes, and I feel at this point I should get an honorary citizenship because I've been filming in... <laughs> Canada so much between Toronto and Vancouver and Calgary everywhere. Well, we Just, would be happy yeah. to bestow that on you. Anybody want to give me a citizenship? I'm ready. <laughs> First of all, as a side note, after watching that intro clip, who wants to have like an X-Men marathon now after that? Man! <laughs> I haven't seen a couple of those in a while, and I'll just tell you a brief story. Summer of 2000, it was a sweltering hot evening in Santa Monica, I was with my family on a uh, trip, and we were walking by the local cinema there, and um, X-Men was in the marquee. And I said, we got, I said, Dad, we gotta go see this X-Men movie. It's, it's, I remember the animated show uh, coming back from high school. I was 20 at the time in 2000. They were sort of like, eh, I don't know, you know, it, comic book movies weren't a big thing then. And we saw it, and the entire family loved it. It was obviously a global smash, and um, to me, you will always be Jean Grey, no matter how many times they revamp the character or recast it. But take us back to the uh, early days there with Brian Singer, because that particular movie, the first X-Men, really paved the way for what we see today with these modern tentpole franchise blockbuster comic book superhero movies. Yeah, I think that up until um, the, our first X-Men, we had seen these movies being really super glossy and uh, over, you know, highly exaggerated characters with uh, costumes that were, you know, they, they just they were amazing movies. They just weren't the characters weren't as relatable, I think, as the comic books originally, to me at least, seemed to have portrayed these characters. And then when Brian Singer came up with the idea of doing. Um, our, the first X-Men movie, and the one thing he kept repeating over and over again, he said, these are real people with real issues and real problems. They're just like you and me. They just happen to be mutants with special powers, but that's not what we want to focus on. So even in every part of the movie, in terms of costume design or whatever, he wanted to make it relatable and um, really go back to what I think the comic books... That's interesting. I didn't know that was the mandate sort of in the vision right from the get-go, and that's very refreshing, almost ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. And why is something like an X-Men property uh, or, or a world like that so important these days when we struggle so much with diversity and inclusion? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the reason why for decades these comic books have been, and the, and the movie adaptations have been so successful, and it is because... It deals with all the subjects that we keep dealing with, you know, in our daily lives. We're ostracized based on our skin color or religious background or, you know, sexual orientation or whatever it is. There, it's all these differences that we have between people that, you know, for whatever reason, we have trouble accepting one another for those. Um, and that's really what the X-Men um, comics have dealt with. And so, and what the other thing that I think what I've always been very proud of in the X-Men series is um, the strong female characters. Because, yes, right? It's just, it was so wonderful that, and, and I, again, I, I want to, you know, I think Brian Singer can take a lot of credit for that. I mean, obviously, the, the characters were already written, but the fact that he chose to have so many in the first X-Men movie and, and really focus on them. Yeah, and uh, speaking of strong female roles, a couple of years before that, of course, there was Xenia Onatop, one of the best pun names in James right. Bond history. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that was the first movie featuring Pierce Brosnan, and uh, that franchise has changed a lot. What do you remember, or what do you take away from working on a Bond film? Well, I mean, speaking of something having been, been around for 50 years, they, have to, they kept reinventing, or they continue to reinvent themselves by changing the bond, and hopefully one day we'll have a female bond, that would be fantastic, and um, <laughs> I think so too. Uh, I'm ready. And <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, yeah, I think it's really amazing what they've done, because it's, it's a genre that you would have thought, you know, would have somehow would have outdated itself with these women that were largely seen as sort of props and um, highly sexualized and, um, and then, you know, with, with time, over time, and certainly with a character like Xenia Onatop, and I fought very hard for that. 
is to make sure that she wasn't the traditional Bond girl, that she was somebody who was strong, who could stand up to him. Um, and uh, so that really, I think for me, was ultimately my breakthrough, even though it was a very specific tone and a, and a certain character and a Russian, and I had to prove afterwards that I could actually speak like a normal American sort of could speak. And um, I did know English, and even though my name, my own name's funny, um, that I wasn't like Xenia on a top, but it still, it put me out there and it changed everything. But that me. role was a game changer because it you really. mentioned, it, it, you brought a, uh, an edge and a ferocity to, to that, that, that the Bond franchise hadn't really examined when it came to female roles. Like you say, they were mostly relegated to highly sexualized, sort of paper thin characters. Yes. Uh, but uh, th that was a real uh, interesting twist, I think. And it, and it paved the way for, for later films and roles as well. Yeah. And, and I didn't, I, I sort of felt at the time I had nothing and everything to lose in a way because I had been a model um, prior to being an actress and so all that, that stigma I was already living with of, oh, the model turned actress, she can't act and she's gonna be around for maybe a movie. And you know, um, I, so I really felt very strongly that I had to prove myself. But at the same time, nobody knew who I was and I had done a, a couple of little movies prior to Goldeneye, but nothing that anybody would know of or remember. And um, so I thought, I'm just going to go for it. But it's and funny. <laughs> when I saw you in X-Men, I'm like, oh, that's Daniel Anatop. But no one knew who Hugh Jackman was. It was like, who's this guy playing Wolverine? Oh, he's yes, pretty good. Well, that's the interesting part. I actually auditioned him. I mean, it's funny how just, you know, with time, everything changes, obviously. But yeah, we, we lost our Wolverine on the first X-Men movie due to... Uh, the fact that he had another, another actor had another movie and it was going over and so they had to recast the part. And then Hugh, who was mostly known for his Broadway mm -hmm. performances, was called in and um, they said, oh, we're going to have this actor named Hugh Jackman, he's going to come in, so can you please read with him? We were already filming at that point. Really? Yes. Now, of course, I have to probably read with Hugh to get a part in a movie with him, but <laughs> probably won't even remember my name. <laughs> And you've also done a lot of television, uh, Hemlock Grove. Tell us about your, uh, yeah, your experience working on that show. That was a very well, special one. I filmed in Toronto um, for three years. It was really exciting, a great character, <laughs> very diabolical. <laughs> for whatever reason, I'm always asked to play these really outrageous women over you know, the span of my career between like, Nip Tuck and um, How to Get Away with Murder. And yeah, <laughs> thank you. And um, on the blacklist, Redemption, and just, they're very strong, opinionated women, you know, with a twist and some agenda and whatever. And then I feel, and then there's me. And I don't really understand what they're seeing and why. I'm, but it's fun to play these women because they're so different than I am. But yeah. yeah. Like, like, what do you look for when, when you see roles that, that come your way? Or, or do, you, do you seek them out in a way? Like, are you looking for a specific archetype of character? Or just something that really challenges you? Or something that's, you know, fresh? It really depends. I mean, it, it depends per project. But certainly when you do episodic television making, whatever, then it's, some, it's somebody you need to grow, be able to grow with, and not somebody that after an episode or two, you're like, okay, I'm bored, what can I do next? Well, yeah, and television is now, uh, it's so legitimate, you know, and, and you talk about character arcs, and there's some stuff being done in television shows that has more depth and uh, production than, than your average Hollywood movie. So there's a real opportunity for uh, a lot of seriousness for these roles to be taken on the small screen, right? Yeah, that really has changed over the years, um, and especially now, of course, with the arrival of Netflix and HBO and other platforms where you can do episodic storytelling, really high quality with the best writer, directors, actors, everybody in the business, and have get really take the time to unfold that story and tell that story and have character development in a way that I guess in film you can't do as much anymore because we have these big, wonderful movies like X-Men, um, but there's a lot of plot and there's many, many characters so you don't have that much time for character development. And then we have the tiny little independent films and whatever was in between, traditionally the romantic comedies and all of those are almost gone. Um, so we now have this wonderful new-ish platform of where we can tell other stories over a length of time. And it's, I think it's been an amazing, especially for us women, I think it's been a, a game changer because now all of a sudden we are castable again in a, in a way that we haven't been because you know they want young people often for um, the big blockbuster movies uh, or you know they're just that window or that time where you could 
work that's kind of gone and it's now really on, on television or episodic or we want to call it. So it's a very exciting time, I think. And it's a great new form. It feels much more like you're, you're reading a novel in a way as a, as a viewer because you can, at your own pace, you can decide, do you want to watch the first, you know, three episodes or do you want to binge watch the entire thing or, you know, it's just like a book. You decide when you want to put it down and when you want to read it. Yeah, and it's like you say, when you compare it to the average two-hour movie, there's not going to be that much room for that much examination and the character yeah. development and, and the conflict and uh, the nitty-gritty. But uh, yeah, the shows can really spread it out like that. Now, you're a multifaceted performer. You, you also are a screenwriter, a director. Uh, do you do uh, writing these days, or, or are you mainly focused on acting? Um, it's been a little bit of everything. I mean, obviously, I've only directed one movie, um, Bringing Up Bobby, and then since then, I've written at adapted novels, done some writing, um, and then for whatever reason, because of my career and how discombobulated that gets with traveling and not having a good rhythm, um, this past, the past six months I haven't really written in the way that I wanted to, so I started doing little art projects instead that are more, um, <laughs> you know, for in, that I can do in a certain specific amount of time and I don't have to, because with writing I find you really just need to dedicate yourself to it and you can't just do it between takes or b between uh, projects as much. You need to hole up in the log cabin for six months and uh, pen, yeah. pen away at it, right? I know, that sounds a little scary. I don't know if I would survive <laughs> that, but I'm scared. <laughs> now talk to us about, uh, if you can, some of the upcoming projects that you have that you're involved in, because you're still very busy. Yeah, I'm trying to be. Um, it's it's been fun. This earlier this year we we shot um, Redemption, Blacklist Redemption, but we did not get picked up for another season, so that's done. I did make an appearance on uh, the actual Blacklist that hasn't aired yet, so you'll be able to see that. I did a movie with Cuba Gooding Jr. that uh, and Cuba directed it. It's called um, uh, Louisiana Caviar, and I am virtually unrecognizable because I am I have tattoos everywhere. I designed this complete character. This was so much fun. Yeah, and your fun. hair is kind of short too, really right? Really short hair. It was a wig and, um, yeah, tattoos everywhere. And it was so much fun to just in between uh, while we were filming, I would just go like, oh, I need to go get a coffee or something. And I would w just walk into a place. And the, I was treated so differently because I looked so differently. And in the hotel um, when I would come in at night because we tried. It was a, very time-consuming, these, um, <clears throat> these tattoos. So we tried to see if we could preserve them overnight. Um, so I had to sleep, you know, <laughs> with no movement. And it's so humid in New Orleans anyway, so it's really difficult not to sweat them off to begin with and with wardrobe changes and all of it. And I was allowed to shower, but not rub anything and no oil, which is really hard for me. So, um, but just the change in, in people's perception and, and how I was treated. Was that kind of liberating for you as well? It was, really, yeah. <laughs> I thought, wow, I gotta just think that through in how clearly I, I think with the way I look, sometimes I can appear standoffish to people or intimidating maybe, and I'm so tall, which doesn't help. Plus but you're the phoenix. I'm the phoenix, but not everybody would know that. But yes, there's that. But this, like, you know, everybody was just talking to me, and yeah, it was fun. What kind of role is that one for you? Who do you sort of play in that I movie? I play a lesbian photographer okay. who's um, somewhat of a predator in the way wow. that we've seen lately in the news. So, uh, yes, she, really? loves, she loves women, and she doesn't mind going after anybody and to the point where it gets her in trouble. And how was it to work with Cuba Gooding Jr.? I oh, really had no amazing. idea he was a director now. He is so energetic. I don't know where that man's energy comes from. I mean, you can see it on screen, obviously, but then to see him... Um, He's still like that guy jumping up and down at the Oscars when he won for Give me the money, show me the money, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, so to see him go between, you know, behind camera, in front of the camera, and he was wearing these cornrows, and you know, he had this hair and cornrows, and yeah, he's, he's great. I think he's a really good director. I can't wait for the movie to come out. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's talk Taken, because I love those movies as well. Uh, what was it like to work with Liam Neeson on those thrillers? Yeah, he was, that was really the reason why I ended up taking that part, because the, I mean, we all have seen the, or the people who've seen the movie, we all know it's not a, a very big character in the film, but it was just, it was a no-brainer to me. I, thought, I can work with Liam Neeson, yes. <laughs> yeah, and the second one, you, you actually had a lot more to do. I felt like you, you were more yeah, of a Yeah, and then the third the one, story. they killed me. But <laughs> what As else it goes. is new? Yeah. They always want to kill me, no matter what I do. They yeah. s find a way to kill me, and then I'm like a cockroach. I just keep coming back, you know? 
Every single time, it's like, Jean Grey dead, I don't care. I'm coming back as the Phoenix. Phoenix, Phoenix dead, Horizon. I don't care. I'm coming yeah. back in the Wolverine movie and dream sequences. <laughs> Can't get rid of me. Uh, I also love The Blacklist, and it's too bad that uh, Redemption only went one season, but um, talk to us about, about the, that experience, because uh, that seemed like a fun role as well to tackle. It was. I mean, it was. It's uh, episodic. is very challenging. I, it, it's something I'm not used to as much. I've done Nip Tuck. I've done How to Get Away with Murder. Some of you know worked with them in um, Blacklist Redemption. But it's just I'm a perfectionist, and so it's really hard for me to go like, okay, so I have to learn all these lines, and I have about three minutes to do it, and we're gonna, oh, we're gonna change the dialogue on the spot, and so it's it, that part of working is not something I'm as comfortable with because I want my time and I want to live with the character and then I want to, you know, really just think it through and analyze it and do whatever. And that you don't get that time in, in television. You just have to be, especially when it comes to network, like Blacklist, it goes fast. And we got changes constantly. I mean, I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning going, oh, what has she, oh, everything's changed. And then by six o'clock in the morning, like, oh wait, it changed again. And, and then I spent the entire night memorizing lines. And then by the time I got to set, I was so tired, I could barely say any lines. So probably, I've learned my lesson. I think it's probably better to just try to get the sleep and then do the best with what you can. But it's a different way of working. It's very, I like the pace when you're on set and you work and you're filming and you don't have to sit around and wait. Because I remember when I came back from, um, for X-Men Days of Future Past, I was filming um, something else in Canada and they were shooting in Montreal and they had asked me to come back for the one scene. And the film I was doing was a little indie. And then when I came to set, I remember looking around and I go, what are we waiting for? What is happening here? And I guess everybody was so used to that pace, but when you go to an independent film or a television, it's such a different pace that it was like watching paint dry because it's just, it's so much slower. They have five months to shoot an entire film and on an indie you have 20 days or something to do it. And in episodic television, you get eight days to do an hour. And then when you have that downtime, is it hard to uh, continue that momentum as a performer because you sort yeah. of have to be in the zone, right? And then you can quickly lose grasp of the character. You do, right? especially I, I was I just remembered when you showed that clip of, um, uh, me and, and Hugh and I in the in the laboratory and when I said, you know, please kill me. Um, I was in that state for probably the entire day of filming because it took really long time to scene, uh, to shoot that scene and of course obviously he gets thrown against the wall and there were stunts involved and there was just a lot of stuff happening and I couldn't break it. I, I didn't want to break it, but it's mentally very exhausting when you do that and I'm sure it's much better again to just go like, all right, I'm just gonna have fun, dance a little, do whatever, have some food <laughs> and then go back to it. But I don't trust my own instincts as an actor and I feel like I just have to go sit in there in that bottle, in that misery. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's open it up to uh, some questions and we'll just sort of go back and forth. Um, we'll start over here, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm stripping for a second, so go, <laughs> just go ahead. I'm and not gonna stop sorry. you there. I'll just, I'll just stop you there. Uh, you can adjust the microphone, so feel free to move the, uh, the boom stick down there if you want um, Thanks, Thor. to adjust it, yeah. <laughs> um, if you could take character traits from Jean and Olivia, and put them into your own life, which ones would you choose? You mean from or which particular character traits? Yeah. Um, well, I would learn from Jean how to have two men fall in love with you at the same time. <laughs> Seems amazing. Um, and then from Olivia, whew, I guess I would do that on a day when I really didn't want to see anybody because that woman was so standoffish. <laughs> That may be, you know, when I'm in a crowd somewhere and I really don't, I'm not a fan of crowds. I always get a little claustrophobic, so, or in an elevator when you're just, people are too close for comfort. I think maybe then I would take some Olivia standoffish traits with me. Thank you. Thank you. To really adjust here. Oh. Hi, so, Hi. oh my, okay. Um, my question for you is, um, what was your favorite memory from filming the X-Men movies? Well, I think it was just that we 
I did it over a span of about 14 years. And in that time, as you can imagine, you know, all the people I worked with, their lives changed. They had children, they had divorces, they had, you know, things happening to them. So we just, as a group, went through a lot. And it's really fun to, it was fun to re get reacquainted with them over time. Um, and see them and do, especially because we had so much promotional traveling going on and we would travel to, to Japan together or uh, Europe or whatever. So I think the moments of just spending time with my co-stars who were all just lovely, that was my, my fondest memory. That's awesome. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. All right, let's take a couple of questions from over here. Go ahead. Hi, I was just wondering if you could talk about your experience working on House on Haunted Hill and making, remaking a classic horror movie. Yeah, it's always a little scary when you when you get into that territory of redoing something that's been successful or people have um, liked for very specific reasons. But um, I try in those cases not to put too much weight on that and really give it my own spin um, and hope that you know and, and make it real for me. But it was you know I mean it was a great cast again, really great cast uh, and um, a fun project to work on. I had a, I had a really good time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one more question from over here. Oh. Hi, um, my question is, um, you had the small cameo there in Days of Future Past, and uh, like Sir Ian McClellan or Patrick Stewart had larger roles as older versions of themselves. Were you ever considered or approached to have a larger role in that movie? Um, and I was curious, would you ever consider reprising your role as Jean Grey in the future? I came back because they asked me to come back because they said, you know, we have this idea of bringing back the characters and we want to keep it all very secretive. And so whatever was written was there. Nobody, I didn't turn anything down. I didn't change anything. It was just there. I was never asked to play a bigger part or anything like that. And it was, uh, you know, because I've been part of that franchise for so long, it's just something that I felt um, was a good idea. And it paved the way for Sophie Turner to mm -hmm. play Jean Grey because otherwise the character couldn't have been reprised by anybody. So I think it's turned out the best for everybody that it happened that way. Awesome, thank you. All right, over here, sir. Hi, um, you've had the chance to play a lot of range of characters. And uh, so I guess my question is, uh, will you go on a date with me and be my girlfriend? <laughs> ha. There's always one. <laughs> Next. Nice try, pal. Okay, let's go over here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, you got to admire the cojones on him. I was wondering what it was like acting on Star Trek with Patrick Stewart. Oh my God, I was so fresh off the boat. I was, I, I was born and raised in the Netherlands and I spoke Dutch for the first 20 years of my life, exclusively Dutch and nothing else. And when I came to the United States at the age of about 21, 22, uh, originally not as an actress, but um, to, as a model. And then, you know, after that I went to Columbia University and I tried to, you know, do dif different things. But when I finally was cast in that, it was something that I was so intimidated by the dialogue that I had to say, because first of all, my English wasn't that great. And then I had to say all these weird things that, you know, make sense in the Star Trek world, but they make no sense in my world. Um, so that, again, with last minute changes where on the doorstep in the morning, I'd be like, oh no, I have to memorize these lines again. It's just, you know, it was a good introduction, introduction into television. But such an amazing episode. It's, you know, Kamala, the perfect mate. It really was something that I'm proud that I did it and it was, I was new to acting, fairly new, and I'm sure if I watch it back now, I'd be like, oh, no, 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 let's take an acting lesson together. Let's go make some changes here. But I mostly was struggling just to say the lines and sound only like a half a foreigner at that point, which was okay, because I was Kamala. I could be from, I was from outer space somewhere, so it was good. <laughs> All right, one more from Thanks. over on this side. Um, uh, hi, Famiki. Hey. Uh, I was curious to know, um, with X-Men The Last Stand being kind of a controversial film, uh, do you and your co-stars talk about it, or do you guys uh, think about the other film work that you do? How, how was X-Men The Last Stand a controversial film? Um, um, it, it's, it was kind of divided when people saw it, as far as I know. 
Oh, you mean in terms yeah, of the reception? Yeah, with Brian Singer maybe uh, not directing not, it, yes, it had a different feel to it. Else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, I think the thing with um, sequels to movies and and a franchise is that over time, different voices come in. They do come in, and some movies are liked better than others. Even some movies that Brian Singer directed were liked better than the other ones that he did. It's just it's hard to keep it one voice consistently. Um, and there are always going to be films that stand out as better ones than other ones. So I think for me it was personally a great experience just because I got to enter partly at least into uh, Phoenix and Dark Phoenix. So I had some really interesting stuff to do in it. And I'm sure everybody's super excited about the new one coming out with uh, an actual Phoenix uh, story. Line. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, th it... I mean, yeah, sure, it was a flawed movie, or but um, there, there was a good arc to your character there, so yes. there was some finality to it yes. as well, right? Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people were just upset because so many of our characters were killed off. Oh, and yeah, that, that's understandable. You know, that kind of left... But, I mean, eventually the door opened for Brian to make Days of Future Past and come up with a way to bring them all back again. But that's probably not... I don't think anybody was ready for, for uh, Xavier to go, um, right? That's why they brought him back to yeah, play the, exactly. the older versions. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, over here, sir. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I really liked your role in um, How to Get Away with Murder. So I was wow. just wondering if. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if it was challenging for you to play a lawyer and if you would be reprising your role. Everything's challenging for me. Trust me. <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, somebody born in another country speaking a different language, and so everything that I do feels different and a challenge for me in a very exciting way. It just, I, I don't think I would have liked my life as much if it hadn't had these enormous challenges and hurdles and things in it. Um, but that one was another one. I mean, here I was paired with um, such an incredible actress <laughs> that it was... That's, Viola I mean, Davis. Viola Davis, speaking of, you know, in, in being intimidated. I mean, what a powerhouse that woman is. <laughs> So you just, you know, you just do the best you can. You go like, I'm just going to go do this thing. I'm, I can play a lawyer. I can be a opposite Viola Davis, and I'm going to make this work. I'll figure it out. So that's kind of the way I live my life is I'm scared, I'm intimidated, and then I just hurl myself off the top of the mountain and hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, over here, another question. Hello, Femme. Just wanted to know, what was your favorite swear word? My favorite one? Swear word. In life? Yes. <laughs> um, hmm. <laughs> you gotta think about I'm that one. I'm gonna go super PG with this one. In Australia, they say crikey. I don't know why. I like, I like it so much. It's such it's a... It's like crikey. Yeah, it, crikey. And then, they say, and then in the old movies that I watch a lot um, from the 1930s, they say nincompoop. <laughs> How, what an amazing word nincompoop It's a good word. Is, right? Nincompoop. We'll anyway, go with that. Trust me, I say all the other curse words as much as anybody else, but I'm, I'm going to go with the original version. <laughs> Here. Sounds good, going old school. Yeah, old school. Thank you. All right, one more question from this side. Go ahead. Hi, I was wondering how you felt about Sophie's interpretation of a younger version of your character. Um, I think she's a lovely actress, and I'm, I'm really excited that that uh, franchise finds a way to continue going. Um, so she reached out to me after she was cast, <clears throat> and she asked me if I had any pointers for her, and she was very complimentary of my um, depiction of Jean Grey over time, and I wrote back and I said, you're an incredibly gifted actress. No matter what you do, it's going to be amazing. I can't wait to see it, and that's how I felt, and I still feel. So I can't wait to see what she's done in the new Phoenix movie. All right, Thank over you. on this side. Hi there. Hi. Uh, we're in a crowd of a lot of different fandoms. I was wondering, what are the things that you geek out and get excited for? That movies I geek or, out? Yeah, movies or TV shows or comics. You know, I, I geek out a little bit over science and stuff. I mean, like, like I'm going all the way geek and nerd. <laughs> like, I get super excited about this article that I just read about, my, you know, like I said, I'm from the Netherlands, and they found some way of farming and exporting tomatoes and things where they use 90% less water. And I'm going like, wow, this is, you know, the future. We should all team up together and find a way to do this. So that kind of stuff, or about planetary things that I read, 
the, I'm going super nerd with are this. You, so are you into different. science fiction at all when it comes to books no, or movies? No, I don't know. I mean, and then it's all, everything's old school. I think I was born and raised in the wrong time. <laughs> I like, like The Shining and, you know, <laughs> movies like that. It can't get too gory. It's fine if the blood comes out of the elevator like it does in that movie. But I can see, like, heads exploding. <laughs> okay, over here, go ahead. Hi. Um, Hi. You've always done really strong female characters that I really connect with as a woman. I don't feel your characters are objectified for male gaze. I uh, really empathize with them. You talked about um, pushing for Xenia on top with the director. I was wondering if you could talk about standing up for your characters in order to, to give them that quality. Yeah, I mean, it, to me, it's really important. I was I was raised by a very strong mother, who in turn was raised by a very strong mother, and so, and I have two sisters, um, four nieces. I come from just a, a family of women for some reason. Um, there are some men floating around, but they're not important. <laughs> it's really about the women, and so, and they're strong women. So it's something that I've always, and and the movies I've you know watched over time and. And, you know, again, going back to the old movies that I watched, for, for whatever reason, I always go back to movies from the 1920s and 30s because women were the female protagonists in those films. They were allowed to be funny and quirky and beautiful and sexy and everything and smart all at the same time. Um, and so I find that still, to me, the most interesting time for women in film. I think now it's a good time. We're seeing a lot of changes happening as a result of this, you know, movement in episodic storytelling. But I do believe, for me, as a responsibility as a woman, I have to, I have to try to um, really make these women as not only strong, because strong is not only what we are. We're complex, and we should be allowed to be a little bit of everything. But what comes with me is strength, just because of the way I was raised and because of the way I had to uh, learn to be in a in male-dominated businesses um, like the fashion world that I um, had to grow up in and um, Hollywood obviously and so it's just something that I've had to fight really hard to stay up and, and um, get parts and live in a and compete in very competitive environments like that so it's something that I don't I don't take lightly what I do I love what I do but I also know that with that comes a responsibility to people like you who want to have women to look up to, who want to have characters they can identify and associate themselves with. So I try to look at it that way, and if I feel that in whatever way they're objectified, and this and this is going to be completely, I came up in a movie recently, I won't name many names, whatever, but I was asked to take off my top, and it felt an entirely gratuitous moment that had nothing to do with what the story was about, or wouldn't have moved, didn't work for the character, and I really had to fight and stand up to make sure that didn't happen. And so it's just, you know, you have to be protective of yourself, but you also have to be protective of your character. And you have to ha have an understanding of the larger platform that's involved in that. Of that Thank you very that much. Question. Great question there. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent yeah. answer. All right, we're running out of time, so we just have uh, enough time for one more question, and then we'll wrap things up. What was your favorite scene to shoot in the X-Men movies? My favorite what? Scene to shoot. Oh, boy. I mean, as much as it was dreadful, the one that I just talked about, in a way, because it was so emotionally draining, but I still really enjoyed the scene where I hurl Hugh against the wall. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Call so me crazy. <laughs> why was the last stand so draining for you? Was just the, the nature of the character or were, was it based on what you were going scenes through as a person like, No, at the time? it was just scenes, scenes like that. Just because right. I, when, when the script initially, when, we, when I first read it, I said to the writers, I said, wouldn't it be great if instead of she's Jean Grey in one moment and then another scene we see her as the Phoenix, how about it's something that, in an almost a schizophrenic way, it, she goes between the two and it overtakes her. Um, and they really liked the idea, but it was not easy to <laughs> execute as an actor to do that. Yeah, you couldn't really have the unbridled sort of fun and adventure like the first two movies. No. It was like, yeah, no, there were no like, emotional. oh, like you guys all having fun at lunch, and I'm just sitting there like listening to really depressing music and <laughs> uh, bawling my eyes out.
<laughs> All right, I'll just leave you with this, and I just want to get your comment. Uh, I'm not getting into the details, but there's obviously a sea change going on in the Hollywood industry, and um, I think it's long overdue. So for a young woman who wants to get involved in acting, get, get to Hollywood, what would you say to her right now in terms of advice? What would you pass on based on your experiences and the major long overdue changes that are happening right now in the mechanics of the business? You mean you talk about sexual harassment and all that? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think you should never be ashamed. You shouldn't always feel strong. And when something doesn't feel right, you just speak out and talk to people. Don't, I think what happened and what we've seen happening is that so many people were so scared to speak out for fear of not working again, for fear of these powerful people who abuse you know, that power um, and put them in incredibly uncomfortable situations. And so I think hopefully what we're learning from this is that A, there's no more to tolerance for this, and there, for this, and there isn't any more tolerance for this because everybody's scared as they should be. It never should have happened in the first place, and I'm so grateful it's coming out now, and I'm, I'm proud of all the women and, and men who are coming forward who've been put in these compromi compromised situations. Um, and uh, I hope this continues happening and it opens dialogue for what is acceptable behavior. And obviously this does not only, it's, this is only not true in, in the film business in Hollywood. This is true for every business because women have been treated that way for so long. Um, so it's just coming to light and, and the fact that it's coming to light in a business like Hollywood is good because it becomes very public. If it had come forward about, you know, a, a case of somebody working at McDonald's or something, it probably wouldn't have gotten as much press, even though it should have, but it wouldn't have probably. The fact that it's coming out in Hollywood in such a, you know, in a, in a field, a business where people are constantly, you know, out in the, in the spotlight and everything is dissected that they do, it really has opened this as a dialogue for all of us to question our own behavior, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So, you know, don't, don't put yourself, if you can, in a compromised situation. When you find yourself in a situation you're uncomfortable with, get out of it, speak to somebody, speak your truth, don't be afraid. Um, because you're not alone. I mean, that's what we've learned. We're really not alone in, in any of these cases. So many of us have dealt with this. Thank you so much for spending Thank some time you. with us. Give it up Thank for Funka Jensen. Thank you. Thank you.